très grande et belle journée. It's September 10th, 2013, just a few days shy of the 18th anniversary of Quebec's last bid for sovereignty. In the years since, the pleas for an independent province have subsided. They're a faint whisper among discourse of other more modern issues. Quebec nationalism is used mostly as a trap for politicians to try to lure each other into. The sad, ethnocentric note which the last referendum ended on turns supporting separatism into political suicide. C'est vrai qu'on a été battu au fond par quoi Par l'argent et des votes ethniques, essentiellement. Out of a very tense couple of decades, a modern Quebec had emerged, one that, even just as a child of its parent country, had found ways to satiate its desires for self-governance over time. Despite its perceived confinement within a much more conservative Canada, Quebec society still found ways to progress. One sector this new Quebec was finding it excelled in was technology. Be it some combination of the fact that the language division had left Montreal with six major universities and that our government's commitment to education led to programs with costs less than $2,000 per semester, a lot of folks here started pursuing engineering degrees, including yours truly. Society happened to set itself up in such a way that people who may not have been able to had they lived somewhere else were able to pursue STEM careers here, and in the 2010s that meant computer science. Around the same time, Quebec was fighting a war for talent with its southern neighbor. The so-called brain drain was a real concern among technologists. Folks from Quebec would take advantage of their circumstances to complete affordable engineering degrees here, then apply for cushy jobs at Amazon, immigrate, and pay off their 14 grand tuition in a matter of months. This practice would become more and more common as we got deeper into the decade, threatening Quebec's way of life, one that sort of only worked if the government's investment into cheap education paid off by creating productive, tax-paying members of society. To many new grads, though, the math didn't add up. You're telling me I can stay here where I'm taxed a quarter of my income and salaries are lower to match the low cost of living? Or I can go to the States where they'll pay me 100 k right off the bat? <laughs> Choice is easy. Me? I love this place too much, and I'm happy to pay what I owe knowing it goes towards making this a more or less equitable society. But a lot of people I know fucked off the first chance they got. It was such a big deal. I remember profs basically shaming students who had plans to move to the States after school. So Quebec had a problem. Its social services were being taken advantage of, its educational investments weren't benefiting society. Quebec's universities were pipelines delivering technically skilled taxpayers to <laughs> Seattle and California. How do you combat that? Well, the government was willing to bet that there was another motivator besides money that allured programmers, the ever-enticing coolness factor of a job. And so Quebec set its sights on beefing up the coolest industry it had, video games. See, due to some other quinky dinks we won't get into, but I will say, according to a former boss of mine, all stemmed from a particularly talented group of engineers and the copious amounts of cocaine they consumed over many sleepless nights, developing some pretty cool animation and rendering tech, which you can think about the next time you, uh, you watch Jurassic Park. <laughs> Anyways, by such coinkydinks, Montreal had long been a hub for digital media and 3D graphics companies, sharing exactly the kind of workforce you'd need in, say, a large video game studio. Hence, all of the biggest game studios eventually setting up shop here, and the government, eager for their jobs to inspire young, skilled technologists to stay, was willing to hold the hands of these studios every step of the way. Well, I'm here, I might as well say, I mean, I didn't, I didn't plan on filming here, we just kind of had to because it was late, but... Right, th this building here, which you can barely see, that used to be the uh, the EA office uh, where I worked as a teenager, uh, as a as a QA tester, playing uh, World Series of Poker, Simpsons Tapped Out, uh, Need for Speed on the iPhone, fucking uh, Monopoly. One of our, one of the the best bugs we ever flagged in Monopoly was that the money that was falling from the sky looked like condoms. I think we played a little bit of Dead Space on the fucking iPod Touch. No, the bit the biggest one I played was World Series of Poker, though. <laughs> Anyways, it was a different time. But anyway, speaking of big game studios, ta-da, the one I literally worked at. <laughs> September 30th, 2013, a Monday, Pauline Marois, leader of the Parti Québécois and current elected Premier of Quebec, is at the freaking Ubisoft office in Montreal to announce a massive $10 million financial aid grant as well as a slew of new multimedia tax credits which would, and still do, save studios and cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars per year. All this to help fund Ubisoft Montreal's huge seven-year expansion plan, one that would bring 500 jobs to the city. Nous voulons maintenir, créer des emplois payants dans les secteurs de pointe qui ont contribué à la réputation d'excellence du Québec. By Friday of the same week, she'd visit Warner Brothers Games. There, she'd grant them nothing. 
the seven and a half million granted three years earlier still hadn't run out, I guess. Three months later, she'd be granting another half a million to Ubisoft's office in the capital, Quebec City. I'll tell you, as a student, 2013 was the year of, wow, the government really wants me to become a programmer so I can work on the next Assassin's Creed, eh? I got halfway there. It was surprising to see how the public responded to politics and video games becoming so intertwined. On the one side were folks who thought the government spending millions on video games was, well, as silly as it sounds. On vous connaît, Ubisoft. Vous faites partie des, 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 des fondateurs de cette industrie à Montréal et on connaît bien Ubisoft, cette grande multinationale. Pourquoi vous avez encore besoin des crédits d'impôts et de l'appui du gouvernement pour investir comme vous le faites aujourd'hui? There's also a weird sense of pride among people, even those who never picked up a controller before in their lives. Hey, to Quebec, you sit où l'Assassin's Creed est fait, on est un leader dans l'espace des jeux vidéo. You'd see pickup trucks out in les régions, the, the boonies, with the assassin insignia and shit. It was fucking crazy. Guidance counselors at schools would name drop studios they'd never heard of until it mattered to them. Oh, you know, a lot of our graduates have found themselves working for EA and BioWare, so if you get those grades up, you never know. You could be working on the next, uh, the next Mass Effect or something. The Ubisoft investment, among others, was a hot topic, one of the hottest political subjects around the time, if it weren't for uh, something else. Let's, uh, let's, let's take things a step back. See, just 20 days before stepping into Ubisoft's offices in Montreal to announce her government's major video game investment, Pauline was working on her other thing. On September 10th, 2013, Madame Marois walked into the National Assembly in Quebec City to reveal a fancy new set of laws. Très grande et belle journée. Pauline was here to finally reveal Bill 60, La Charte des Valeurs Québécoises, the Quebec Charter of Values, aka the Hijab Ban. Je suis convaincu qu'avant longtemps, on citera cette charte comme exemple de ce qui aura contribué à rapprocher les Québécoises et les Québécois. On paper, the Charter was meant to reinforce a value Quebec had held dear since the Quiet Revolution in the 60s. Laïcité, secularism, a strong separation of church from state that many attributed much of the province's social progress to. In application, though, the Charter disproportionately targeted minority groups by banning display of the turban, hijab, and kippah while performing or in some cases even receiving social services. All state workers, from doctors to school teachers, would no longer be able to wear any religious symbols larger than a ring or a pendant. Now, I say disproportionately because, of course, there were three specific exemptions laid out by the Charter to preserve one, the crucifix in the council chamber of the Quebec National Assembly, two, the lit cross at the top of the eponymous Mount Royal, and of course, three, state sponsored celebrations of Christmas. Le Parti Québécois uh, sera favorable au déplacement du crucifix du Salon Bleu vers un autre endroit. Le sapin de Noël va rester, va rester là, puis euh, il va continuer à s'appeler Noël. Marois had been grumbling about updating Quebec's stance on reasonable accommodation since a few controversial stories made headlines in 2012. She finally proposed Bill 60 a year later to fulfill her campaign promises. Her leadership was over a minority government, though, which meant the opposition party members could push back. C'est un projet que je peux déjà qualifier d'impraticable, d'illégal et d'inconstitutionnel. Even the other pro-separation parties thought the Charter was awful and hateful. They'd learned from the 1995 referendum that were Quebec to have a serious chance of separating, it would take a more inclusive campaign, one that accounted for all the ethnics. On vit un jour triste parce qu'on est en train de dire à la population notre projet de souveraineté, mais c'est pas un projet inclusif. At the federal level, Quebec clearly needed to be reined in. The new charter was being treated as unconstitutional, state-funded discrimination. Even Prime Minister Stephen Harper, aka uh, Mr. Hardon, stepped in to say that Canada would protect the fundamental rights of all Canadians. This, of course, got Marois pissed. She started threatening to use her hidden veto to pass the bill no matter what. Anyways, it was a crazy fucking time, <laughs> needless to say, a pretty sensitive one. Keep in mind, Marois took office right on the heels of the student protests. Quebec's news cycle was ripe with controversy. It was very interesting being siege up aged at the time. Excusez-moi, mais c'est pas clair. Dans un CPE, une femme musulmane, musulmane qui décide, moi, je, 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 pour des raisons intimes, je veux pas l'enlever. Mm -hmm. Ultimement, elle va le devoir bon, partir alors, du CPE. Ben, Soyons attends, clair. Ouais, mais attendez. Moi, je crois qu'une société et que des personnes peuvent évoluer, peuvent changer dans la vie. Et c'est à ça qu'on va mais travailler. Ça, Alors, la va... de la personne. Mais regardez bien, là, Patrick, à la fin de toute cette période, dans quatre ans, dans cinq ans, on refera le point, 
s'il y a quelques cas, on trouvera sûrement des solutions. Et quand on veut adopter une charte comme celle de la laïcité, c'est pour clarifier les règles du bien-vivre ensemble. Quelqu'un qui va venir d'Asie, d'Afrique, euh, d'Amérique du Sud, va savoir exactement dans quel état cette personne va vivre, Donc, quelles sont les règles sur la langue et sur les règles euh, quant à la laïcité de l'état et la valeur qui est fondamentale pour nous du respect de l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes. Well, what's really funny looking back on it is how clearly both of these work streams, you know, investing in video games and discriminating against religious minorities, were on the government's agenda at the same time. Whenever Madame Marois was in the news, you never knew if it was because she was trying to ban hijabs or because she just invested in another video game studio. One minute, she's fighting Muslims, the next, the Templar. It's like from 2012 to 2013, she wasn't up to anything but gaming and hating on brown people, which, when you put it that way, is, 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 is kind of a gamer fucking move. Let me tell you, Mario, she's a fan, but don't you fucking come to her about the Prince of Persia, she's gonna blow a fuse. <laughs> Personal beef, but to me, how I remember Pauline most was through her niece, who happened to go to my CJEP and who once prevented me and my partner from getting our Mac on because she very desperately needed to tour into the office, apparently. So, picture me, an 18-year-old college kid just came out of an inadvertently ethnically segregated primary and secondary school system because of the at least three census-level minorities I'm a part of. Politically active, I, I picketed right down the block over there in front of my college during the student protests. I'm interested in the world around me, I'm playing cool games, I've got my dream college job, I'm working at a fucking video game studio part-time, I'm being primed intrinsically and by my school and my government to work in the industry after uni. Suddenly, my city's golden goose sells its soul to lay its next big rotten egg. Ubisoft welcomes into their office and shakes hands with a racist, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic government so they can pump out games like fucking watchdogs, I guess. All these factors were enough of a brew for me, and no exaggeration here, to commit to a personal boycott against local Ubisoft games for over a decade. I played Assassin's Creed 2 in 2009, and then nothing else from either Ubisoft Montreal or Quebec until a moment of severe boredom during the COVID peak in 2021. I will admit I did play Zombie U back in 2016, but only after making sure nobody from Quebec was involved in it. I'm sure you're wondering though, what was it? What local Quebec-made game finally convinced me to break my streak? Well, Phoenix Rising did. And after playing through a bit of Phoenix and noticing some things about it, I admit that I had second thoughts about my <laughs> virtuous mission to avoid all Ubisoft games. I finally defected, and made up for lost time by picking up as many old Assassin Creeds as I could find. Games I had spent over 10 years avoiding like the plague because I believed supporting them meant aligning with the studio's anti-minority government benefactors. In playing Phoenix, I couldn't help but infer something about the studio and what must be the nature of those who worked there given that something like this would be their output. This was a realization that was tough to grapple with for me. It invalidated and was an unsatisfying denouement to my firmly held boycott. <laughs> Fucking hell. This is the same province. That when I was just over a year old, the Prime Minister got on TV and basically said, if you're Italian, Greek, or Jewish, you don't belong here. The same province that passed Bill 101 before I was even born that basically said, if you're Italian, Greek, or Jewish, you go to a different school than everyone else. Phoenix forced me to ask a very difficult question. Why are people from this province treating my heritage with such respect suddenly, putting so much effort into respectfully depicting people of my ethnicity of all things through design, performance, and most importantly, casting? My whole fucking life, it took a studio from fucking Quebec to produce the first ever piece of media where I ever heard a Greek actor portray a Greek god with a Greek accent? Are you fucking kidding me? What else have I been missing? Finally visiting some of the old Assassin's Creed games I'd missed affirmed that inference, before I'd even climbed a single wall or vaulted a single fence. All along, Ubisoft Montreal was trying to be as clear as possible about their stance on the politics happening outside the development of their games. In the interstitial screen that appears before even reaching the main menu of any of their games, Ubisoft Montreal made a point to remind players what kind of people were responsible for these works. This work of fiction was designed, developed, and produced by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs. Then it clicked. Why here? Why Quebec of all places to make a game like this? No, no, no. Being here is exactly it. For most, I imagine this is practically an encoded message, but knowing this place lets you read what it really says. Multiculturalism means something different in this province. 
Why? Well, representation here is not a given, even for the majority of French Québécois who have continuously struggled to belong in Canada. Being anything but the norm here makes you a minority within a minority. That sort of environment, I think no matter which side you're on, leaves its marks on any productions that come out of here. Politicians and broadcasters are constantly in our face trying to tell us that minorities have two choices, assimilate or leave. So how could a socially conscious developer from here ever think that doing anything but depicting people as faithfully to their origins as possible would be right? That's why the Hellenic deities in Phoenix speak in Greek accents, why a quarter of Assassin's Creed 3 spoken performances are in Kaniakeha and by actors of indigenous descent, why they bother hiring Middle Eastern people to play Middle Eastern characters, and yes, even why sometimes when you kill a Byzantine guard, he'll scream. Ubisoft Montreal, despite the circumstances and environment just outside their door, gets representation. It gets diversity, and it clearly gets that good representation isn't easy. It's, it's not just a few clicks of the paint can tool for brownie points, it's hard work, research, consultancy, learning, reconstruction, heaps of effort and cost sunk into something that doesn't make the game, the product they're selling at the end of the day, immediately more fun to play or easier to market. Compared to their contemporaries, it's stunning how much more Ubisoft clearly cares about representing diverse peoples well. And what's even more surprising is the footing they're doing this all from. Or, better said, whose checks they've cashed to do it all with. <laughs> how ironic is it that with a $10 million investment, a bigoted xenophobic prime minister unknowingly funded the studio responsible for probably the world's most advanced procedural niqab generator? Yes, I'm referring to whatever system generates random NPCs for Assassin's Creed. Shouts out to a couple of programmers for, uh, <laughs> for undermining the entire Quebec government. <laughs> Why is it that Quebec, home of the hijab ban, unfair schools, the vote ethnic, is also where some of the most sensitive studios to the needs of underrepresented ethnic, racial, and religious groups exists. Whereas studios like Supergiant in California, supposedly blue state land of sunny days and chill vibes, can only pull off half-assed performative schlock when it comes to diversity. Nothing of substance. Nothing for nobody. Of all places, Chris, why does Montreal, a city in constant debate about the rights and representation of minorities, make the kinds of games it does? Well, to answer that, you're, uh, you're gonna have to walk with me. What the putain de Saint Simonac of Jelly Bean of Saint Moufette of fucking Fruit Loop, call this is this the You are full of surprises today.